Welcome to this brief overview of predicting asset failure of IBM SPSS Modeler. In this session, we will briefly discuss the applications of asset failure prediction within the context of predictive maintenance programs. The data that organizations use to deliver this capability, as well as providing a quick demonstration of how IBM SPSS Modeler can be used to deliver the predictive models that are at the heart of these applications. The ability to predict asset performance in terms of the risk of failure and to identify the assets in the field that require proactive attention forms a core capability of predictive asset maintenance programs. And predictive asset maintenance is used in multiple industries from power utilities to manufacturing as well as the oil and gas sector to ensure the availability and uptime of key assets, plant or equipment. And in doing so, reduce the cost associated with outages and reactive maintenance. Effective predictive maintenance programs use historical data from multiple sources. And these data sources may relate to environmental conditions such as recent weather or temperature changes, the interactions of the asset such as maintenance history including unstructured data relating to the inspector's comments, the asset register itself recording the nature of the asset, its age and location, and behavioral data such as telemetry, system logs, alarms or recorded events. These data sources are the raw material that are used to build the predictive models that indicate the likelihood of the asset failing or requiring attention. Let's now take a look at how IBM SPSS Modeler can interrogate these data to do just that. So this demonstration shows how we can begin building a risk of failure model by combining different data sources in completely different formats within the Modeler application. In this example, we're going to use data related to the asset register, the maintenance history of the various assets, as well as environmental data. And we're going to combine them all together to create what's called a mining table that's going to allow us to build a predictive model. And assuming that we've already cleaned and prepared the data, we can actually view the merged data using a little procedure here known as the audit node. And that allows us to see the various fields that we've combined together here. Note that the uh, each field has a little chart associated with it. Sometimes it's a bar chart, sometimes it's a histogram, and that these charts or graphics are colored, and they're colored by a key field, which is our target field, which is whether or not there's actually been a fault on the asset. If it's green, then the asset's okay, and there's no fault associated with it. If it's yellow, then it's T for true, there has been a fault detected historically with that asset under certain circumstances. We can see the minimum maximum score so it gives us an indication of what the range of values is and we can see if we double click on one of the uh, histograms here for average maximum load we can see that uh, there seems to be some sort of relationship here between uh, uh, the asset fault and the average maximum load. It could be that that field or that particular recording uh, may play a role in helping us predict uh, whether or not an asset uh, actually has a fault on it or not. So we wanted to get it go right ahead and actually build a model. We find that there are in fact lots and lots of different algorithms and models that we can bring to bear when we're trying to classify an outcome. Here are the list of the different models we can bring to bear. So rather than choosing an individual model, what we can actually use is an automated procedure, the auto, auto classify here, which will run every appropriate model against that target field to try and uncover the most accurate model or the one which is most overall accurate. Uh, and it may, it may even uh, choose uh, uh, different algorithms, try them out against one another, and then rank them in order for us in terms of the level of accuracy. So in this case, we're asking it to retain the top three models that it finds. It's going to run about uh, 10 or 11 different models, and we'll see how it does. But before we do that, to make it fairer and to make it more realistic uh, and to simulate how the resultant models are likely to behave or how accurate they're likely to be when we actually come to deploying them, we're going to add in another procedure here. This is called the partition procedure. And the partition procedure allows us to split the data into a training and testing sample. So in this case, the default is, if I look inside that little node, the default is uh, a 50-50 split. So we're going to build the model in 50% of the data. This is a training partition. And we're going to 
tested on the remaining 50%, the unseen uh, partition, the unseen sample, and see how well it would have performed uh, on, on, that, on that testing sample. So at this stage, we can go ahead and run the auto classifier uh, against our target field asset fault and ask it to retain the best three models that it finds using a range of different algorithms that are appropriate to try and predict that outcome. And it retains them based upon overall accuracy. And it also retains the top three based upon the performance of those uh, top three models on the testing sample. That's the 50% that we've actually held back, not the training sample. That's the 50% that the model's been built on. We can see it's going to build up to 12 models. It's retained three. It's discarded five so far. And it finishes relatively quickly. It's done within about uh, 30 seconds or so. And what we expect it to produce here is a physical object for us, an actual uh, what's called a model nugget. And inside that model nugget, if we look inside it, are the top three models. And the top three models that's found, well, the first two are actually derived from the same algorithm, a slightly different version of the same algorithm, one that's called the C5, a rule induction algorithm. And the last one is support vectors machines. That's a different type of algorithm. We can see how accurate they are. So the first one is 80% accurate, 80.6 versus 80.5 versus 80.47. So it's only marginally more accurate. It uses 17 fields, however, uh, as opposed to 22 for the support vector machines. And we can see how accurate it's actually performing because we can double click on the little chart here associated with that model and we can see the false positive uh, the f and the false negative rate associated with it. So F and T along the bottom here literally relate to the actual outcomes, that, you know, the, the recorded outcomes of whether or not there was true a fault on that asset or F, there was no fault. And here we have the predictions themselves, which appear in the legend. So we can see that when it comes to predicting uh, no faults, that uh, that first model is pretty accurate, that it's actually the vast majority of times it's accurately predicted to be no fault. When it comes to predicting actual faults, it's a little bit less accurate, but again, much better than random. Overall, it's 80% accurate, taking into consideration both categories. It may well worth, uh, may, may well be worth retaining this model. If we want to look inside the model and see how it's actually coming to this conclusion, we can double click on it and see that in fact, what it's done is it's uncovered a series of what are called rules using a rule set. And here is, if we look at rule set one here, it says, I've got seven rules, and of those seven rules, uh, I've got six that uh, predict whether uh, predict true outcomes, i.e., yes, there is a fault. If I look inside that, if I look at the very first rule, it says I find 77 occurrences in this first rule, and they're 91% probability of 0.91, 91% accurate. If we look at that first rule, it says if line score is greater than 6.7 and major component failure within the last six months is greater than zero, then I predict T for true there will be a fault associated with that asset. And it just continues to do so. It goes down through the data and finds other rules using combinations of the input fields uh, that we gave it when we were building the model. So it's done that very quickly. And we can see, in fact, all of the rules it's produced. The rules are in relatively plain English. Uh, that's not true for all of the algorithms that we use. Some of the algorithms will produce um, output, which uh, comes in the form of a formula, such as logistic regression, and some of them don't really allow you to look inside the, algor the algorithm itself, the much more black box, such as support vector machines or neural network. We can actually compare the overall performance of these different models by using what's called uh, an evaluation or an, assess uh, an assessment procedure at the end. Or alternatively, we could just say, well, do you know what? I'm just going to pick the very first model here. I'm going to generate that model. I'm going to cherry pick it out and I'll ask it to generate that that very first model, I go to generate model to palette, and you can see it flashing up here in the corner. And if I double click on that, it attaches it to the worksheet. I'm going to bypass the original model. And I'll show you what this model actually physically produces by putting a little output node on the end here and putting what's called a table node. This will show us all of the data that was used, 3,666 records. And this is the original data that's gone into building the model. And if we look along the end here, we'll see that, in fact, it's produced a new 
uh, two new fields for us is produce the actual prediction itself, which is the dollar C, which is T or true or false. And it's produced the confidence value, so it thinks that this asset here is likely to be a failure, or it's like, yes, likely to have a fault associated with it. And it's 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 seventy percent confident in that uh, in that prediction. If we want to look at how that performs in a little bit more detail, we can put on an analysis node at the end here and ask it to produce a little cross tabulation for us. Click run. And here it shows us how it performed on both the training and the testing set. On the training set, it was 81.88% accurate. It's a little bit less accurate in the testing set as we would expect. And it shows us how well it performed on the training and testing set, both in terms of the trues and falses. This is simply a reflection that we saw earlier on of the bar chart. So we can see that it's been accurate with producing trues 348 times. It's, miss, it's missed them uh, or it's failed to produce them, uh, to predict the trues and predicted them as falses 251 times. Conversely, it has accurately predicted falses 100 and, uh, 1135 times versus 105 times where it's been mispredicted. So it's generally accurate overall. If we wanted to use this model, uh, to actually score data on an ongoing basis so that we could assess the level of risk associated with our assets. Then uh, in the next section we can uh, show you how easy that is to do and how easy it is to actually push out the results from those models to a uh, third party system or to another data source so that the, the work management crews can take, can, uh, the work management system can take account of those risk scores. So in this final section, we're ready to deploy the model against current asset information. And to prove that uh, we've only got current asset information, if I run a data audit node, uh, we'll notice that uh, this time the fields are potentially going to go into the uh, resultant model and produce these uh, risk scores. They're all the same color within the sample graphs. That's simply because we do not have a target field we don't know if there's a fault associated with these current assets. That's the job of the model to help us detect that. So if we pour that data uh, down through our C5 rule induction model that we produced earlier on, as you saw, that's going to produce a new number for us, which is the likelihood of there being a fault. And because we're really only interested in that number, I can put what's called a filter node on the end here and ask it to filter out everything except uh, the asset ID and the probability of fault, which I've simply renamed here to make it a little bit clearer. And in fact, I can graph that probability of fault as a histogram. If I run that, it shows me the distribution of probability of fault. And of course, those towards the higher end of the distribution are those assets which have a higher probability, higher likelihood of their fault being associated with them. And if I wanted to select them, I could, uh, I could go to the view menu here, switch on the interaction menu and call up the interaction. Uh, controls here by clicking on the slice slicer and put that in there slice it and let's say we were interested in all the assets above roughly 0.8 and if I right click on that I can ask it to actually generate a select node for me so it will actually go and generate a node for me and I can look inside that and see how it's doing and it says well if probability of fault is above 0.80 I'll just round that up to 0.8 then it will select them. So if I hit preview again, we can see that, yes, everybody, all the assets within this have a high probability of fault. And then if we want to actually punch that data out so that we can uh, put it into, let's say, a work maintenance schedule or so that we can attach it back to the asset register, we can simply connect it to an export uh, node here. In this case, it's going to back, go back out into a data set and it's going to create a table within that data set called high risk assets. If I click run at that point, it goes off and it starts scoring the data in order to identify the highest risk assets that need our attention. So when it comes to the deployment, the thing to bear in mind is that our models can be used to generate risk scores based on new data as and when it becomes available. So that means new risk scores can be generated on a regular basis as assets age and as they're subject to new conditions and new changes in the environment. And we can use those risk scores quite intelligently. We can multiply them by consequence values. We can multiply them by 
the amount uh, of money that we're likely to lose or cost due to the asset suddenly failing. And that will allow us to prioritize which assets we should look at. Alternatively, we may wish to rank the assets in terms of their risk and then use the changes in the risk rank to help us identify assets which are suddenly likely to fail. Large changes in the risk rank allow us to then target those assets. And we should bear in mind that we can integrate these scores in real time, potentially with multiple third party systems. Thank you.